All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to another episode of the Remarkable Coach Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Michael Pacheco. And today with me, I am joined by Dr. Sam Jennings II. Uh, Dr. Sam is a stealth coach of over 20 years. Uh, he serves leaders who lead leaders through strategy, brainstorming, and coaching. And Sam helps his clients resolve the tough stuff to get to the fun stuff. Uh, Sam, can I call you Sam? Please do. Third method. <laughs> welcome, uh, welcome back once again to the Remarkable yes. Coach. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be back. It's yeah, man. It'll be fun. Awesome. I appreciate you making time to, to chat with me again. Um, for those of our listeners and viewers who haven't yet had an opportunity to hear Sam's first podcast, that was released on November 23rd, 2022. Um, so go back and take a listen to that. And for those of you who have not yet had a chance to listen to it, Sam, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself in your own words and kind of get people kind of caught up to speed a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So to be clear about the stealth coach, the reason why I use that phrasing is because I was in higher education for 20 some years and I thought I was just being a decent supervisor. And it turns out I was coaching a whole time. So the fact that I'm running coaching as a business, I've been warming up to this for a couple of decades. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's come naturally to me and um, I get to work with people all around the world who are sometimes individual contributors run up to you know, senior vice presidents. So I get to see a pretty wide array of types of people, but the problems are always the same. Yeah. How do I interact with people more effectively? Yeah. And once we get that nailed down, we get on to the fun stuff. I love it. I love it, man. Um, so again, yeah, our last, our last chat was published back in November of 2022. Get us, uh, catch us up a little bit, get us up to speed. What's, what's new on, what's on your radar since then? So there's a couple of things that um, are on my radar, probably on most people's radar to some degree. Uh, part one is the constant refrain of nobody wants to work anymore. Still going strong. And part two is um, the generational issues seem to be not going anywhere. And to tackle the second one first, it seems like for me, the word millennials is an all encompassing word for those dang kids today. <laughs> it's not the millennial generation that folks are discussing. Yes, please. Question, is is it still millennials? I mean, it's 2023. The youngest millennials are probably in their 30s at this point, right? Yeah, So is exactly. it still, is it still, I know it was millennials, you know, five five years ago, 10 years ago. Is it still millennials or are we hassling Gen Zers now? <laughs> yeah, it's it, we're, uh, well, we're op equal opportunity hasslers apparently because it is from Gen Zers. Um, and millennials, but it is issues that in some ways aren't even present. And, and other ways, maybe they are to, somewhat, to some degree. Um, to give an example, I uh, was talking with some colleagues about this kind of issue, and you know they were kind of wringing hands over you know work ethic and so forth. And the point I brought up was, well, we've all discussed separately how much we would hate growing up today with social media being omnipresent and what can or can't happen in that space. And the anxiety that brings on. So to assume I won't show up someplace else is a little short-sighted. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, yeah, that's that's a different issue because we hadn't thought of that. You know, we didn't have to panic every time we opened a computer. We didn't have computers. But besides that, it's, the panic level wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So, quote, unquote, kids today have grown up in a whole different space than m many of us can even understand fully. Yeah. And b by us, I think you, you're talking about Gen Xers. Gen Xers, I'm, you can't see this uh, on the podcast, but I've got a little bit of wisdom in my hair, so I've got a little bit of Latina on me. So are you, yeah, the Gen, Gen X-ish range, yeah. You, are you an elder elder Gen X? Oh, gosh. I think I'm dead center Gen X. Okay. Um, 72, so I don't remember exactly the, the uh, sounds generations. sounds about right. Down. I'm yeah. 1980, so I'm, I'm, I'm the youngest. Like I think 81 on is, is kind of millennial, so I'm just like, I'm barely there. You squeaked um, in. I'm, ba I'm, I'm barely there with the grunge generation. <laughs> um, well, cool, man. Awesome. Um, I know one thing, one thing that we talked about, this is a, a little bit of a, uh, a tangent, I guess. Um, sure. One thing that we talked about in that first interview um, a little bit was Todd Herman's book, Alter Ego Effect. Mm -hmm. Remember we, we chatted about that some? 
And that, uh, that conversation inspired me to, to read that book. And I just want to say thank you for that. What a great book that is. That's awesome. I don't, yeah, um, go ahead. Please go ahead. I was just going to, I, I was just going to say, I don't, I don't, I don't yet have a pair of glasses that I put on for my superpowers. Um, but, uh, uh, the, the idea of, of, you know, donning, uh, a, a superhero kind of persona, um, mm -hmm. you know, is, I think it's something that I was a professional musician for, for a number of years and I'm a natural introvert. And so that was something that I did without really thinking about it when I would go on stage and to perform or something like that. Right. Um, and, and, and afterwards, you know, talking to, to fans and that sort of thing. Um, but, but ha reading that book and, and seeing how, you know, some certain professional athletes did that before they went out on the field and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was just, it, it put, uh, it kind of put stuff that I was already familiar with in a mm -hmm. new in a new frame in a framework that really just kind of made sense sure and i think that the idea of um pseudo sort of playing a character going mm -hmm. to a certain scene or scenario like that is healthy mm -hmm. um you know people talk about um i am who i am you can't change me so yeah but contextually you change behavior based on your circumstances i would really hope it's a yes because not everything requires the same outcome. So, yeah, the introvert who's a musician, people say, well, how can you do it? I really, really, really want to play music. So I do. And yeah. also, yeah. I take another seven days to recharge. That's exactly. how things go for me. Um, yeah, I think there's two... Mm, that's an overstatement. I'm not sure people give enough credit to how much transition folks make when they're engaging in a behavior that is um, to require <laughs> skill and expertise and it's outside their comfort zone, but they're just really good at it. It yeah. requires a lot of energy to still perform that way. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, I mean, like you, I, like, like you said, I really wanted to play music. I don't know if it took me seven days to recharge, but it definitely took me seven hours to recharge after yeah. that. You know? And I yeah. just kind of wanted to crawl into a quiet space and just <sighs> breathe right. a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had a client who was um, nervous about doing, uh, informational interviews and mm -hmm. then the interviews themselves and those kinds of interactions. And I just asked, how long does it take to recover? And her assessment was maybe half a day, depending. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do 10 interviews a week, you've got two a day and you're recovering for a full day. That sounds like a lot to do. Yeah. So I, I, I'm sharing that because I don't want to um, diminish the not just recovery time, but prep time. I mean, all, all the, the the shoulders on either side of the brains itself require some folks a lot more energy. And mm -hmm. those of us who are a little more on the extroverted scale, maybe don't appreciate how much it takes to, to show up in a space where that's not your natural space. Like mm -hmm. extroverts have a hard time being quiet. So you tell them to be quiet and you know, they can't quite keep it together. <laughs> they do the, the, the leg tapping underneath the table. <laughs> leg tapping, they're vibrating. They're like, yeah, well. Save your comments for a different time. <laughs> right on, right on. Um, cool, man. Well, so yeah, I mean, talk to us, talk to us a little bit more about uh, your your work recently since since November. What who 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 are your who are your clients these days? Are you working with the same kind of client? Yeah, the clientele stayed about the same. You know, and I mentioned in part of this part of the conversation about the, the nobody wants to work anymore. Um, I am working with clients who have. Some of that kind of concern with either, well, among the issues, higher turnover, um, related but not the same as maybe slightly less longevity, and the things that you see on social media, uh, applicants ghosting them or mm -hmm. not showing up for the first day of work, and the what to do. Uh, it's easy for me to say, you know, as a third party, but one of the issues is if they don't you. Isn't that probably the earliest, best indicator that they weren't your people? Mm -hmm. that's, that's not a too much of an issue out of that. It's not appropriate. You shouldn't do that. But if that's how they're going to show up by not showing up, at least they weren't on the payroll. you know. Uh, but then we do talk about things a little more actionable in terms of how is your team showing up and is that hospitable bringing somebody else new in? And if it is not a friendly space for somebody new, what can you do to help? that up and odds are very high that if you change that 
cultural behavior, not just for people to open they say they will, but more people be attracted to that space. And the folks who are there will be happier in their day jobs. So there's a no loss um, mm -hmm. perspective here. It's just if people enjoy work, good. Productivity goes up, recruitment goes up, longevity goes up. It, it, it went all the way around. Yeah, nice. Yeah, we when you were you were talking before about uh, I think your quote you said you said nobody wants to work and then you and then I mm -hmm. cut you off when you, when you when you mentioned millennials. I apologize for that. Maybe derailed your train of thought there. Um, and now you're you're kind of speaking to you know uh, clients with high turnover, applicants ghosting them. It sounds like a lot of like HR work. Is that is that kind of your your focus there, or how how does that play into um, leaders that lead leaders? If that sure. Right. So, yep, the relationship is it's so my LinkedIn post just today. I was grousing about um, so I, don't give me excuses, give me results. Okay. Well, sure. We all want results. Of course we do. We wouldn't be doing stuff. We didn't expect results out of it. But that's about one of the laziest leadership approaches there is. So when we think about that kind of approach, mm -hmm. who wants to work in a space where all they bark is no excuses? Okay, well, sir, on my way to work, I was managed to uh, have a limb severed. Oh, no excuses. I mean, it's just, It's asinine. Mm -hmm. So what kind of culture are you creating when you say no excuses, just results? Culture of maybe some companies who I will not name, who had people create fake bank accounts to get their numbers up, to get their bonuses, right? It doesn't matter how you get there, just get there. Mm -hmm. It's unethical and it's not a fun place to work and you lose people. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about leaders leading leaders, those are the folks who are creating the culture that people want to work in or want to leave. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, we understood that People don't quit their job to quit their boss. Mm -hmm. And relatively recently, people started changing the language a little bit. People don't leave their job to leave a bad culture or a toxic workplace. Mm -hmm. And I'm hitting the brakes on that as hard as I can because mm -hmm. no workplace exists. No culture is created without humans doing it. Mm -hmm. Some bodies, some actual people are making this thing happen or at least um, fostering it. Mm -hmm. So let's not candy coat it. It's mm -hmm. humans being humans in certain ways. So if I can help leaders lead their teams of leaders who are leading their teams to create spaces that are engaging, welcoming, people find their purpose, people have some autonomy and creativity, they're going to do a better job, higher productivity, and really enjoy coming to work. So all this nestles together that you don't have to recruit nearly as hard if you're selling a great product. So mm -hmm. if you've got a great place to work and you're maybe even a great place to work list, then folks know. I don't have to think too hard about, is my boss a jerk? His chances are decent. Or not, but people like to work there. So it's all, it's all interwoven. And one of my colleagues likes to say, um, if you're in a business that produces anything and you have more than one person in your business, you're not in the thing business, you're in the people business. Mm -hmm. So HR, the leadership, all of it, it's respecting people and treating them like actual human beings. And it's frankly, not that hard, but also not always valued. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe not that hard, but it's it can be... Um... It can be easy to, uh, it can be easy to kind of put that on the back burner when you've got mm -hmm. fires that you're putting out and, and, and when you're being reactive to things, right. And you're not prioritizing the people first. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. You know, if the building's on fire, we're not going to ask how people are feeling about it. However, <laughs> if you have to ask, you don't, you're not doing your job anyway. <laughs> how do you, how do you feel about the building being on fire? <laughs> Tell me about exactly. that. Tell, tell me about how that makes this you is a vulnerable feel. space. Just let it out. Um, so this is uh, a couple a couple things I want to unpack here, but let's start with with the idea of of culture. This is you are not the first coach or the second coach or the tenth coach that I've talked to just this spring about culture. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a hot button topic. Mm -hmm. right now in, in, in like right. spring, summer, 2023. Um, is that, is this something that you're, you're seeing in, in the marketplace, in, in, in your clients where things are, are you seeing a shift of focus towards culture? Is that on your end? Is that on the client's end? Why do you think, and maybe you don't know, that's okay too, but why do you, why do you think that there seems to be this shift in 
focus in a, in a lot of coaches work toward mm-hmm. culture. Right. So my hypothesis on that is directly related to the difficulty some employers are having hiring people, uh-huh. getting them stick around. Yeah. I was at a, um, a, a networking event and there was an HR panel and they were discussing this topic and said something to the effect of, we need to change how we recruit because the applicants are looking for something else. So while that's good to hear, I also want a car that is durable, reliable, and effective. But if you show me a car that's just shiny and clean, but doesn't actually do the thing I need it to do, I don't care. Yeah. So it's more than the advertisement. It's the culture. When they get there, are they going to have an experience that reflects what you say they're going to have when you advertise it? So even more down the, uh, the rabbit hole slightly, I've done uh, diversity training and discussed you want to increase diversity. Right. And first of all, diversity is record keeping, right? It's accounting. You count the number of faces and stuff. You go, okay, we're, we're diverse now, magically. Mm-hmm. Are they intercultural competent? Can it actually interact with people in a way that makes sense? So if a company wants to increase their diversity and they hire some folks who don't look like the others in the, in the space, when those folks show up, are they going to feel comfortable? Do they have a chance to feel comfortable? If, if folks aren't already there, why is that? What is it about that culture, that space, that environment? that does not already attract folks who you are labeling as diverse. Mm. And once we get to that, then how do we create the space? And then once you hire folks, they want to stick around a little bit because they can feel the belonging. It won't be perfect. It will be great. It'll be pretty good. Mm-hmm. And then more folks come in, more learning, more struggle and get to good and great. I like, I like the, the, that that's a really good point that you're making there where, I, I've, and I've seen this as well, where companies will put, they'll almost put like, they'll, they'll make diversity hires over the mm-hmm. top of anything else without mm-hmm. making any other changes. Right. And that's, you know, that's that you're putting lipstick on a pig, right? I mean, yep. is essentially right. what, you're, what you're doing. Um, right. You know, that's, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's, that's just a, that's, that's a great point. If, if you're not mm-hmm. already attracting um, a, diverse workforce and whatever it is that you do Mm -hmm. let's look at where let's look at let's look at the the core issue and not try to treat a symptom right you're a doctor yes analogy (laughs) exactly and not to tell somebody else's story but i have worked with colleagues who've been that not the diversity in terms of like a eo kind of thing but more of a um they're the one in the room sure right yeah. And the experiences that some of them have shared are things like um, being the expert for all the people that it looks like they might represent. Yeah. And what a disservice to that individual as their own experience. Oh, yeah. Never mind the fact that um, they can't possibly know. And I had a yeah. boss years ago and he said something like, um, I am black. I'm not an expert on being black. Right. It's like, dig it. That, right. that makes a lot. I mean, we weren't putting him in a tight spot necessarily, but uh, he was just, conversation we're having but to the point of if um if folks are hired on it's not a matter of um using them as your google mm-hmm. they're another employee who has a different set of experiences learn from that not from whatever you think they can bring to you yeah interesting yeah um yeah my 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 wife uh is is chinese and she grew up, she was born in Hangzhou in China and grew up in, in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, of, of all places. Um, so she's, she's definitely got some stories where, you know, being the, the single minority in the room and, and mm-hmm. you know, sometimes um, being awkwardly expected to, uh, you know, not, out, not necessarily outwardly asked, but just kind of expected to represent all minorities. Right. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> yep. And it's and to, a company... to what you said, it's like, you know, shh, I am a minority. I am not an expert on being a minority for all minorities. Right. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah. And when a company wants to uh, put together a diversity initiative, it, it's a push and a pull, you know, to put all the, the people of color on a team and say, now make us diverse. Meanwhile, the leadership looks a lot like me, you know, pretty pasty white, yep. doesn't necessarily get it doesn't want to make the change because it's uncomfortable or foreign. So the very people you're trying to support are doing the work that is not being 
um, honored and respected by putting into action. Mm -hmm. So the very act of doing a diversity committee may hurt diversity if you don't take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, man. Um, I've got, I've got mixed feelings on, on the, the whole topic of, of DEI, you know, you, yeah. you, you really kind of break it down the, the biggest, the greatest minority is the individual, right? We're all just different. Mm -hmm. I'm different from mm -hmm. you. <laughs> right. And, right. and part of, part of the problem in my, uh, in my experience and in my belief is, is just willy nilly, the, the willingness to willy nilly group people together mm -hmm. based right. on, you know, I mean, pick, pick something based on whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. That's interesting. I like, I like your, your point though, about, uh, focusing on the actual core problem and not just, mm -hmm. you know, Unless we, we, we're not diverse enough. We have to hire diverse people. It's not the solution. Right. <laughs> we need a great picture for our webpage. Let's do some hiring. Like, right. There you on. go. <laughs> people in that. Hey, you know, and to your point about diversity, one of my favorite <laughs> examples is um, physical ability. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what a colleague I used to work for said that we are, everybody who's um, able-bodied now, it's only temporary. Mm -hmm. Time's coming. You will get hurt. Orange of your body will start to break down over time. It's just how it goes. Sure. And so when we say folks with disabilities, that is a very large umbrella. And, and if we're not thinking critically about what that actually means, it's a sloppy policy statement that doesn't really help mm -hmm. uh, when, when applied you know, appropriately. Or to say, hey, we're helping with our ADA folks, wheelchair ramps. That helps. Is there braille on the bathroom signs by chance? I mean, it's those kinds of things. So. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, isn't there like, I mean, there's, there's laws around that, right? Around uh, ADA laws. American sure. yeah. Association. I know. Um, yeah. I know. I've got uh, a friend of mine is has a law firm in Vegas, and what some of his competitors will actually do. I don't know if you've heard about this. They will actually go to the casinos and with measuring tape, and they'll measure things, and they'll measure the angle of the wheelchair ramps, and they'll go into right. the bathrooms and, and measure how high the the bar is and the wheelchair accessible uh stall for example mm -hmm. and just look for look for lawsuits essentially is what they'll right. do they have so much money it, it, ridiculous yeah you know, so th that's a great example because um a, a company who has a requirement to do so should do so right should mm -hmm. the, the expectations for the, the policy and so forth of course um because it wouldn't be there without people in need Right. So transfer people the best way they can. And then the flip side, when folks go out looking for trouble, i.e. a problem, yeah. you're going to find it. It's going to show up in some way. Yeah. Um, and I think there's some things we can learn through organic learning. That it's appropriate. And I'm not trying to suggest you shouldn't go major ramps. Of course, you should. It should be compliance. And at the same time, um, pay attention to how people actually move and operate. You know, if people are always, for example, if you have an accessible bathroom that nobody uses who's in a wheelchair, yeah. why? What's yeah. the issue with that? And maybe make those observations so you can still serve people without having to get pinched by a, a threat of lawsuit. There's always a, a non, non litigious way to get to a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, I just, I go about my life just, you know, trying to be helpful uh, right. and, and that's it, right? Just be kind. Don't be a dick, right? That's the golden <laughs> rule. Don't be a dick. Just be a good person. That's, for Christ's I've sake. got that cross stitch in a pillow here somewhere. I just can't find it. <laughs> my grandma, my grandma had that on her on her couch. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, man. I mean, honestly, I think you know if you're if you're running around looking for different ways to be offended, you'll find a, a way to be offended by stuff. Mm -hmm. um, right. And that kind of extends to this this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. So it's and, you know to that point, it kind of spin it back towards leadership a little bit. If you're looking for ways and reasons why things are going bad, they're going to show up too. Sure. Uh, but if you're looking for how people are engaged and doing their part, that's going to be a lot more fun to engage. Not to suggest that we should disregard um, things that aren't going well. That doesn't have to be the focus. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a conversation a while back about um not you and I mean a different group. Um people not showing up for the the, the um what's it called? The quiet quitting, right? Mm -hmm. Just the minimum. 
all right, are they though? I mean, if they're doing the minimum with a job expectation, what is it that you want out of them that's not that? And why is it not in their job description? Right. And if they are just doing enough to get by, they're still spending all their energy. Is it because sick kid at home, you know, unhealthy parent, both the divorce? What else is taking up their mental capacity that makes it look like they're not doing what you think they should be doing, which mm-hmm. sometimes isn't even a communicated expectation. So I think that things like um, totally the looking for trouble, the the observed um, observed behaviors that fit your expectations, mm-hmm. you know, self fulfilling prophecy. If you look for it, you're going to find it. And mm-hmm. if you're looking for good things, you'll find those too. Yeah. Yeah. The quiet quitting thing is an interesting one. I, I agree with that completely as well. I mean, you're just making a lot of good points. I think on this podcast that, you know, if, if, if you've got an employee who is doing the bare minimum to get by, then raise the bar. If that's a problem, like right. raise the bar, you're the leader lead. Yep. Right. <laughs> your, you know what I mean? Like do your job, lead, lead better. Yeah. Hire a coach. Yeah. Learn how to lead her. <laughs> exactly right. The evaluation time comes up. Give them acceptable. Uh-huh. They've done what you've asked them to do. Now, yeah. if they've done it with crusty attitude, you can have that conversation. That's a different beast. But yeah, first thing it came up with uh, quiet quitting. Like, so people are doing their jobs. Yeah. What's our concern here? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sam, how are you? So. Obviously, we're, we at Boxer, we're a marketing agency. We work with coaches. How are you marketing yourself these days? I'm doing a lot more uh, in person now that we've uh, gone past the, the COVID right. issues um, and being able to get out and greet people. And so far, I've been lucky enough not to, to get that goofy bug since a year ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so the way I operate, um, let me back up. I have, like I'm guessing you probably do too, plenty of people on LinkedIn who want to ping me and sell me the calendar filling app or service or VA or whatever. Um, and I'm tempted sometimes, right? It'd be easy to get those sure. folks to show up. But I know about me, I'm much um, happier and more authentic when I meet somebody, I get chat with them and hear about their story. How they got to where they are. And I'm not asking them, you know, hey, what's your pain point? How can I solve your problem? I'm just having a chat. Yeah. And we get to the point of, they might say, well, I'm kind of wringing my hands over X, Y, or Z. Hey, tell me a little bit more about that. Not that I'm trying to wallow in your in your pain here, but just I'm curious. Right. And so we have conversations that sometimes are very superficial. Sometimes they're a little more deep. Yeah. Um, I find myself feeling a lot better about how I run my business as long as I'm meeting people, having conversations. If it was a um, a call center, you know, I'm not sure I'd feel toasty about that. Yeah. Are you? If I if I can ask, I'm curious. Are you? Do you get a lot of emails from? age marketing agencies that want to book uh book calls on book sales calls on your calendar i know that was a big thing in the past few years i don't know if i'm not sure if agencies are still doing that yeah it, it's still out there yeah. um and people are asking you know you need a scheduler we can do that for you and the most interesting one i got recently was a person who rewrote the copy on my website and sent it to me and then said something to the effect of um, let me know if you're going to implement this. And if you're not interested in growing your business, let me know that too. Mm-hmm. Buddy, I don't owe you anything. I don't yeah. know you. Yeah. you. Send me this out of nowhere. Yeah. It's just one more email in my box. So so I, I don't respond well to the the cold hard pitches like that. Now I'm getting an entrepreneur so I have to contact people too, but much more organically. And yeah. if I call somebody on the first conversation, say, hey, I can solve your problems. Like not to disparage our coaching friends, but the ones who their pitches, I can save anybody forty five thousand dollars in an hour. So, okay, well that's easy. Um, how many people got on your team? Five. Fire one. I saved you money. I didn't solve a problem. I uh-huh. saved you money. I mean, let's get down to what's actually affecting your business and have that conversation. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I think what a lot of those, what a lot of those agencies, what all of those agencies don't understand about specifically about coaching that I think we get at Boxer, I think we understand this at a deep level, is that coaching is a very, it tends to be a very personal vocation, right? right. A very personal calling. You're, you're typically doing work with people, focused on people, focused on relationships, focused mm-hmm. on leadership, 
um, you know, even even with uh, even with business coaching and, um, you know, one of the running jokes on this podcast is that every executive coach's dirty little secret is that they're a life coach. Because it's true, right? You 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 start you start by changing yourself, and that you know you can change the world if you start with yourself. I forget. Right. Um, but these people, yeah, these agencies that reach out on LinkedIn with these hard sells and these hard pushes, they don't understand that coaches, in my experience, mm -hmm. are about relationships, and right. it's just so much easier <clears throat> to sell a coach by doing exactly the same way that but the same way that coaches like yourself get your clients by having conversations with them and talking with right. them and learning about their problems and offering solutions and just mm -hmm. building that relationship right right yeah it, it's a it's a gap and part of the problem that my observation is that um, it is an expensive endeavor mm -hmm. as a coach to find a client organically and that's just, in my point of view, that's how it is. Yeah. Now, there, again, there's there's the the big, you know, superstar coaches out there, of course, are, and you got people banging down their door to, to you know throw money at them, of course. But the rest of us in the world need to do a little different approach. Um, and if it was in coaching by volume, um, some coaches can do that. Some coaches can do strictly the group coaching, and that's their wheelhouse. Great, good on you. But for a lot of us, it is like you said, that relationship and teasing out the i can't get my people to do x y or z mm -hmm. starting there and working back into what's your behavior that's helping them be okay with not doing it right mm -hmm. and really having those deep conversations and like you said yeah there's a lot of life coaching going on it's about individual behavior yeah. and how that affects others around them that maybe they haven't observed before or even if they've observed it haven't had to care mm -hmm. or haven't had somebody close enough to say you're biffing it and here's why mm -hmm. you're making every man Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, I think it's, you know, well-intentioned biz dev folks mm -hmm. trying to, trying to reach out on LinkedIn, but they just don't understand it, man. And, and like the, right. the, you know, we'll fill your calendar with sales calls. That's just what every coach wants is a calendar full of sales calls, right? That's, that's exactly what every coach wants. No, no coach wants that. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Right. You would read from a script, right? Dear name, how are you? What's your problem today? How yeah. many on your solution? Like, yeah. It, it looks it looks busy, right? So that's more than nothing, but it yeah. may not get you anywhere. I don't know. I haven't tried it, but it's it's not my uh of tea. Yeah, yeah. Cool, man. Um well geez, Sam, I mean I think we, we covered some uh we covered some terrain here. Is there anything else that you want to chat about that we haven't had an opportunity to talk about yet? Um, yeah, there is one thing and it is a little bit more on the spicy side and yeah. I haven't really planned this out, but, um, the conversation around, you know, sales that got me there. I've, I've been certified through ICF, right? Uh -huh. International Coaching Federation. And there's a whole, uh, array of ethical standards we're expected to uphold in order to retain that certification. However, there's no body out there that says in order to be a coach, you have to be certified or you have to observe ethics. Sure. And, you know, some of the things I see or hear rather uh, from coaches who, like you described, just they didn't describe it, they just hang out their shingle. I'm a coach now. Maybe don't observe those ethics. And one of the things that um, coaches, quality coaches can do well is compartmentalize. Uh -huh. So if I'm a, if I'm coaching a team, say of, six or eight one of them is the, the boss whatever that leadership position is boss doesn't get to know what i discuss with the other people sure. because if that's the share that's called spying it's not coaching yeah. but i know that some people think that there's a, an in to the ceo or the, the director whatever the title is if that's the share and that's kind of what they do i i wish there was a different word for it that it was appropriate because calling it coaching even calling consulting coaching Confused with people. And I think that coaches bring such a different set of skills to the table that the use of the name across different skill sets doesn't make a lot of sense mm -hmm. for those of us who want to pretty much stay in the coaching lane. Now, for me, I will, well, I will ask a client and put on my consulting hat just for a second because I mm -hmm. think I see something here. Or if they ask, what would you do? I'm not in your shoes. I don't know. 
but here's what I would do. That doesn't mean that that's what you should do. Um, and I'm wondering too, from your point of view, I, have you observed or seen those kinds of ethical concerns as well from coaches who aren't certified coaches? I, the coaches that I talk to get passed up to me, to this podcast mm -hmm. from For sure. conversations with coaches, which is boxers, other podcast that Kevin hosts. Right. right? Yeah. So it's kind of like a one, two step process. Yeah. So honestly, man, the coaches, the coaches that I talk to on the remarkable coach podcast are pretty solid. Pretty remarkable. Right. I mean, that's, that's, it's in the name. <laughs> right. Right. I should have seen that one coming. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, and not everyone that I talk to is, is ICF certified. A lot of people, right. I think coaching by nature is, you know, more than a career. It's like, it's a vocation that most people stumble into. Yeah. It's not, sure. nobody graduates high school and goes, and goes off to college, goes off to coaching college and says, I'm going to be a coach. <laughs> It doesn't work that way. I don't know why. Exactly. It just, you know, you part of actually I do know why. I think in my opinion, from my experience talking to so many coaches, mm -hmm. one of the things that makes a really great coach, a remarkable coach, if you will, is a disparate set of life and professional experiences. Right? Being able to approach problems from a, an idiosyncratic perspective from, from a right. very unique way and understanding mm -hmm. different ways to frame problems. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and if you can, if you can approach a problem in that way, I think that as a coach, you're better equipped to guide your client in a direction of success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That makes sense. It makes perfect sense. You know, I was with a client just this morning, and, and they work in an industry that I'm fully unfamiliar with. Um, but I asked a question about the process, and I said, "I have, I don't know what your day job looks like. I mean, I, you, I know what you told me. I've never done it. Mm -hmm. Help me understand this one small piece." And in describing that, and articulating exactly what it was, they paused. But oh, wait a minute! Now I know what to do. Please share. What What have you just learned by explaining this to me? <laughs> and, and they went on to describe how to repackage their work to make it more effective and more efficient for them. So the coaching aspect, moving back up, I don't know I would have asked that kind of question if I had just gone straight to um, let's fix it, uh -huh. right? Well, all my experiences I've earned all over all these years have been, I don't think I know everything I need to know here. So what am I missing? Before we decide what we know, what don't we know? What's going on? And then that kind of question gets to the client, gets the client to say, wow, I didn't really realize it until I was trying to teach it to you. And now I get it better. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think coaches that have, you know, a little more, you know, higher worn out on the grid, you know, <laughs> going to blocks many times can be helpful because yeah. they've seen some things and they're not coming to give you the answer, but to help you think through your problem. Yeah. Did that answer your, did that answer your ethics question? <laughs> well, frankly, it didn't, but it was a better answer than okay. I was thinking of because it led to a better conversation, you know, and the ethics question I think is, you know, for the folks who are listening now that, um, it's not a small issue, the uh -huh. ethics question, uh -huh. because if not, not because the coach ideally, in my point of view is a third party, not, they don't get a paycheck from the same company you do, not in the same way anyway, not a payroll. So there's that separation of organizational responsibility. And a leader or anybody's being coached should be able to tell that coach whatever they need to say that they can't tell their boss, they can't tell their direct reports, maybe don't even want to tell their spouse because the spouse can only take so much um, and should be able to dis dispel it and let it all hang out and then get to an answer. If they can't do that with the coach, who do they have left? I mean, there's nowhere else to turn. And I'm not suggesting it's corporate therapy, but sometimes those wild ideas that a uh, client can share and spin into a great solid plan, but they never want to share the wildness with somebody who's in their org chart or somebody who's going to go post that conversation on LinkedIn or on the next client who's in their org chart. Hey, watch out for Bob because he's got a wild idea coming. Just brace yourself. Like yeah. that's not gonna work for anybody. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, man. I mean, like, like I said, I think, I think most of the coaches that I talk to don't, I, I don't know if they have concerns about the coaching industry, mm -hmm. and those ethics, but I know that the coaches that I speak to, and we've discussed this on a number of, of TRC, uh, episodes, remark the remarkable coach episodes, Mm -hmm. Um, where there's essentially, you know, even if, if, even if upper management, for example, if the CEO hires a coach to work with Bob, the CMO, mm -hmm. right? John, the CEO doesn't get eyes on that. I mean, right. he, 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 he gets, you know, maybe surface level updates and that kind of thing, but he's yep. not. You know, uh, w without the CMO's permission, he doesn't get access to those private conversations. It it's it's right. not, you know, um, what do you call it? Um, doctor patient confidentiality, for example, right? It's kind of right. it's, it's like that. Yep. Yeah, for <clears throat> sure. Yeah. I, I'm not seeing a um, pervasive struggle or issue by any means, but just so people have an idea. I used to be a senior conduct officer in my old days in higher ed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I'm all about rules and policy. <laughs> if we can't have good ethics and good procedure, then things are going to go haywire. So when those things do pop up, I like to address it because I'm curious to see if it's pervasive or if it's a uh, episodic observation. Yeah, I think I think from from conversations that I've had, for the most part, everyone, if it's not written in the contract, there's an unwritten confidentiality agreement. Yes. Yep, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, and which is, yeah. you, you need that, right? To You need that to do the right. work. Sure, absolutely. And even with that, clients will say, no, this is just between us. Of course it is. Yeah. The saying ever kind of refreshes their memory too. It's like, oh yeah, this is a big deal I'm sharing with you. And that's perfectly fine, of course. Absolutely. Uh, Sam, this has been awesome, man. What, um, yeah. do you have anything that you want to pitch or promote? Now's your time, now's your chance. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So the main thing that I do in terms of how I serve people is showing up how I am. And one of the things I like on my website is um, I call out, I'm not a business bro. So if you want somebody to come in and, and tell you what's what and you know, act like they've got all the answers, I'm not your guy. <clears throat> but if you do want somebody to really be demonstrate the empathy, listen to your story, and I make connections that not everybody can see. And more than a few people told me that, including the, the Gallup Strength Survey. Um, so no problem is too complex to be solved because it's it's a made problem. So let's figure it out. And I, I'm I love engaging people in those long conversations. And one more thing I'll mention just briefly is I I don't always require a coaching request of my clients. Sometimes we just go on a walk and say, okay, tell me what's going on. And then when they tell me their stories, by second or third story, I can often say, you pick up a theme here, and they haven't. So I share with them what the theme is. And they go, huh? Oh, I didn't see it. It's not. You can't read the label if you're in the box. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. So it's a way I approach it that is my unique, unique style. Unique in the sense that it's mine. Other people may do it too, but it's really where I thrive and where I, I serve people the best. I love it. Awesome, Sam. Um, tell, uh, tell our listeners and viewers where they can connect with you online. Yep, I'm online. I've mentioned LinkedIn. I'm there more often than I probably ought to be. I also have my website, uh, 360-clarity.com. Or email me. It's sam at 360-clarity.com. And um, I look forward to any bit chats, conversations, pop-ins. And if anybody listening contacts me and we have a great conversation, it's not going to end with me giving you a pitch deck or a video to watch. We're going to have actual human conversations and engage in meaningful ways. Awesome. I love it, Sam. That's 360-clarity.com. Guys, we'll have links uh, to all that on the show notes page. Um, Sam, brother, I appreciate you making time to chat with me. This has been fantastic awesome. catching up. My pleasure. I'm glad you did. We, uh, we could reconnect. It's been great. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. And thank you to our listeners and viewers. As always, you guys are fantastic. This show is nothing without you. Thank you for listening and watching. We'll see you guys next time. Take care.